morning. Welcome to Wesley's channel. This is Wesley and this is Wesley's news. Good morning. Come on, Mila. DNA is the hard drive, the memory in every cell of every living organism that has the instructions for how to make that cell. But it's a chemical molecule. It's not magic, it's not special. Uh, it's, it's in fact four different kinds of molecules that can be stuck together in a chain, a larger molecule that is a chain. And you can put those four in any order. Uh, and if you can read that back, you, you have a sequence of, of characters. Uh, if you want to think of it like a digital code, you can see on the right is a little representation of what those four molecules are. Uh, in the middle, the famous double helix structure that nature uses to, to store a sequence of them stably in every cell. But if you read out the information that's there, it's just like a ticker tape of letters, each one being one of the four possibilities. And there's three billion of those, and, and that mere three billion letters defines your genome and all the instructions to make a living human or a living ant or yeast or, or any uh, organism you can imagine. It's sort of like this, but it's incredibly small. Uh, so that, that's one of the databases, or maybe all of the databases. We have a 60 petabyte uh, storage system now that, that we're filling up. It's, it's nearly full. And that gives us a bit of a headache on to how we go about storing that data because our budget does not go up exponentially. Um, but if you'd like to put pressure on someone you know to give us more funding, please do. So we buy more and more computer servers and more and more hard disk drives to store this information. And we have headaches doing this. How do you capture exponentially increasing data? Uh, and serve it back to the whole world on a essentially flat budget. Why do you store this data? Do people really care? Well, people really do care, and we just have a little live demo. What we have here, this is in real time showing you the hits on our website. We have about 100 times more hits on our website than CERN does on theirs. This is the people in real time using the website. If anyone's got a smartphone and they're quick, hit this QR code or that URL there, and if we're lucky, we'll see Davos light up. I don't know if that will work. Probably uh, your phones might not be registered as appearing in Davos. Um, but we get you know, thousands of hits a minute, millions of hits a month. One thing we realized is that all, all this information we're storing, you know, it's about DNA, but the DNA we're storing information about is a digital storage medium. It's a sequence of, well, not zeros and ones like in your computers and smartphones, but a sequence of a discrete alphabet, four letters. And if we could manipulate some DNA, we could put a message in there ourselves and we could use DNA to store it. DNA is a really good way of storing information. It's been used for, for hundreds of millions of years of life on Earth evolving has used that as its hard disk drive. Maybe we could use that. So we divide the experiment into a feasible way of archiving and storing information. One of the things we need to do is to find the way So we had to invent a code that would store information. We didn't just want to store information about genes and processes in a living body. We wanted to store any kind of digital information, just as your computer and your phone and your iPod in them. So we devised a code that would do that. What would be high value information you'd want to store a long time in a DNA format? And we had that made into DNA uh, by, by the Agilent company in California. Uh, and it came in a test tube exactly like that one. It, it wasn't nearly full. In fact, when it arrived, on my, and my, I opened the box up and I held it up and I thought something had gone wrong because it was empty. And my more skilled molecular biology friends had to explain to me that that tiny smudge of dry dust sticking to the bottom of the tube was the actual DNA. And it was a tiny, tiny speck. If the whole thing was full, we would have um, a petabyte of information in there. And that's hard to imagine what something the size of your finger with a petabyte of information is. And by my calculations, if you laid out CD-ROMs all over the stage, you'd get about a thousand of them on here. If you did that a thousand deep, so it'd be up to about here somewhere, this whole stage this deep in CDs, right, that's a petabyte. 
So you can either have that much information stored in that format or something the size of your finger in DNA. You could get all the information in the whole world encoded in a DNA format in the back of one, and for Americans, in one SUV, and for the English, in the back of one estate car. Мы производим информацию с невероятной скоростью. Всевозможные видео, посты в соцсетях, онлайн-анкеты и даже селфи. Берем видео, которое вы мне прислали, записанное двоичным компьютерным кодом нулей и единиц, и конвертируем его в четыре вида азотистых оснований, из которых состоит ДНК. Математик из Кембриджа Ник Голдман изобрел способ преобразования двоичного кода в код ДНК. Другими словами, вы можете использовать ДНК как своеобразный жесткий диск. Расскажите о том дне, когда вам пришла в голову эта идея. В этот день состоялось большое обсуждение, как хранить большой объем информации, которую мы получаем во время экспериментов с ДНК. Мы пошли в бар и стали говорить о том, какие другие способы хранения информации можно придумать. И в один прекрасный момент мы поняли, что ДНК, о которой идет речь, и является решением этой проблемы. Первое преимущество использования ДНК, которое приходит в голову, это ее невероятная компактность. Если всю информацию, которая есть в интернете, сохранить на ДНК, она уместится в коробку из-под обуви. Есть и второе преимущество. Она будет хранить информацию вечно. И в этом колоссальное отличие ДНК от электронных носителей, которые со временем изнашиваются. Это ваш репортаж, сохраненный на ДНК. Где он? Вот здесь. Но вопрос в том, все ли здесь сохранилось. Вы смогли восстановить из этого мое видео? Мы восстановили файл, и вот он. Крупные компании, вроде Microsoft, тоже интересуются возможностью сохранения данных на ДНК. Мы можем читать And even those aren't entirely necessary, but they're the best conditions. The global seed vault in Svalbard in Norway already exists. What they actually store there is seeds, but this is a facility. It costs almost nothing to run. There are no staff there. It's in the Arctic Circle. I have actually 13,000 years history of agriculture. Countries or institutions choose um, to use this as a backup facility. The main reason it's so far north is because Svalbard is cold. It's got a permafrost, meaning the ground never really thaws even in the summer. Most seeds um, can be stored long term at minus 18 degrees, or they can keep for a long time at, uh, at a temperature that isn't that uh, cold either. Um, but that's sort of the perfect temperature. By digging a 130-meter tunnel deep into the mountain, the vault is underneath that permafrost, meaning they only had to cool it the remaining 12 Celsius. The challenge these days is really that the climate changes so fast, so the plants are not able to adopt. As long as you shut the door, it's dark in there, it's freezing cold, it keeps it dry. We already, it's very cheap to run a facility that can store this kind of information. If you want to do it yourself, your refrigerator is just perfect. And if you're really conservative, your freezer is just perfect. Will we have a technology to read that? Well, we will, because it's DNA. As long as we have humans who are technologically advanced, we will be able to read DNA. We're changing the machine every year or two as the technology improves so much, but they can all do the same thing. They can all read DNA. As long as there are people, there will be DNA. Reading.